Good morning. It's good to be in God's house this morning. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn to the Old Testament in the book of Job. The book of Job, chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5 today of Job, chapter 1. Um, if you have trouble finding Job in your Bible, it is there, I guarantee you. Uh, turn to Psalms and go right back before the book of Psalms. It's a little easier to find. Psalms kind of in the middle of the Bible, and you just go back to the left of Psalms, and Job will gloriously appear there. So this morning, uh, we're going to continue on in the series. Last week, we began a new series entitled Character Matters. And uh, along those lines, remember last week, we talked in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and following, but focusing in on verse 28, that, that we know that all things work for the good of those who love God, or for good of those who love God, called according to His purpose. And so last week, you remember I talked about how God is shaping us. And the things that happen in our life and the things that we see going on in our life, and even all the way back from before the beginning of creation, God is making us exactly who he wants us to be, and he's shaping us. Remember the, the clay that I had last week? And Anna Lee told me in the hallway, she said, I can't wait to see what illustration you have today. Well, I don't have a glorious, fancy illustration today, Anna Lee. I apologize for that. But there's going to be something come out of here that you can grab a hold of. Now... I can guarantee you this today. God is doing his part to help form you and make you exactly who he wants you to be. There's no doubt about that. He's shaping your life. He's making you. Everything that's happened in your life is happening for a reason, for a purpose, and it's for his purpose. But the other side of it, and this is where we're going to focus in for several weeks now, on the other side of that, because I have no doubts what God is doing. He's working in our lives. But the bottom line is this. We have to do our part. Uh, God never fails. God always accomplishes what he sets out to do. But the bottom line is this. Sometimes we fail to really uh, do our part in the formation of our lives. In fact, character matters to God, so it should matter to me. My character matters to God. So the first thing we're going to talk about today, and Lisa mentioned it earlier, we're going to talk about integrity. Now, when we look at the book of Job, everybody automatically goes to the word patience. Patience. And I'm not saying that's not going to come up. And we're going to spend a little time in the book of Job. God willing, we will spend some time there. But right off the bat, everybody thinks of Job and they think of patience. Now, we're not going to talk about patience this morning, although probably everybody here needs a little more patience, right? But the bottom line is this. Integrity is something I think that we're lacking in America today. I think integrity, here's what most people deem as being a person of integrity. We've lost that word somewhere along the way. We think of integrity as this. If I haven't cheated on my spouse, if I haven't cheated on my taxes, and nobody's done that, have they? If I haven't killed somebody, if I just try to live a decent life, I am a person of high integrity. We see in the Bible, I believe, that it gives us a little bit different picture of a person of integrity. And we know that Job was a man of high integrity, of great integrity. And so we're going to look at his life right off the bat. Now, Job, the book of Job, is there's some question there exactly when it was written. Who wrote the book of Job? Uh, some, some believe that Moses wrote that book. Some believe that uh, one, of the, one of the men that came and prophesied at Job's side uh, uh, was the one who wrote at least part of it. We don't know the exact time frame, but because of the history that we see in the book of Job, we, we, we can guess that it's somewhere, guesstimate, somewhere that it's, it's early, early in history. In fact, it's probably somewhere after and, and during the time span of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, through that, and maybe even Moses has, had written the book of Job, inspired by God, to help, help inspire the people of God when they were captive in Egypt. We don't know exactly the time frame. Now, we know the place it talks about in the Bible, where it took place. And Job may have been uh, a relation even to Abraham. We, we don't know exactly uh, a lot about Job, but we know enough about Job to realize he was a man of high integrity. In, in fact, I believe that that's the first characteristic that is spoken of of Job in his life. So today, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And we're going to see what made Job a man of high integrity. Because I tell you the truth, integrity is sometimes not what we think it is. 
Sometimes we let, set the bar so low that we forget that God has called us to be a people of high integrity. And sometimes we think we're doing all right, but by God's standards, we need to raise that bar just a little bit. Now, integrity doesn't happen when everybody is looking. Integrity happens when nobody's looking. Integrity is not just because you haven't killed somebody or cheated on your spouse or cheated on your taxes. Integrity affects every ounce of every area of your life. So I want us to stand, and we're going to read Job chapter 1, starting in verse 1, about a man named Job. It says in Job 1.1, 1, 1, There was a man in the land of Uz. How would you like to be from Uz? A man from the land of Uz who na whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. And his sons, who would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the day of the feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Let us pray. Father, we just come to you this morning thanking you, God, for your word. And we stand upon your word today. Father, I pray that you would just use this time together, that we would set all things aside and focus on you, Lord. Father, we thank you for the, the men and women of the Bible that we see that, that live such a high character, Lord God. Lord God, I pray that we would just see and be able to see the examples that were set for us. But Lord, there was no greater example that was set than of your son Jesus. Lord, if there's someone here today who doesn't know Christ as Lord and Savior, we do pray together, we join together our hearts and minds. We pray that you would bind Satan, that your spirit would be free to move. And if someone needs to know Christ as Savior, to give their life to you today, that today would be the day, the invitation will be there. Father, we pray for us as believers. Lord, we know that our character does matter to you, God, so it should matter to us. God, I pray that we would be a people of integrity, God. Lord, though the world looks at us and tries to judge us and tries to find reason for faults, God, help us to not look at them but look at you and what we, you want us to be, God, as you form and shape our lives. Father, be with us here today. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So today I'm going to ask you this question. What made Job a man of such great integrity? What was it that made Job such a man of great integrity? In fact, I want to answer that question today. And I don't have to use five verses to do that. I believe that we can see that in the first verse of the first chapter of the book of Job. It didn't talk about all that Job went through. It didn't talk about all the things that Job had right off the bat. The first thing that was said was four things. And I want to use these four things. They're qualities that stood out in Job's life that made him a man of great integrity. So if I want to walk a walk of integrity, I can look at God's word and I can see the life of Job and he lived that high character life of integrity. The Bible says, number one, in Job chapter one, verse one, that Job was a blameless man. Job was a blameless man. Now what does it mean to be blameless? Now if you have a King James Bible, that's going to word, use a word different than blameless. It's going to use the word what? Perfect. Now, I don't mind that word perfect being used as long as we get the understanding of what that word perfect means. In fact, we can even take the word blameless and we can take it out of context. We can take the word perfect and say this. If I'm going to be living a life for Jesus and I can't be perfect, then I might as well just give up. That's not what that word's saying. If I'm not perfect before God, then I might as well just quit because I'm not going to ever please God. I'm not going to be a person of integrity before God if we look at it that way. In fact, here's the deal. That word perfect means that we're complete. In fact, that word blameless means this. We get from that word blameless, it comes down to the word integrity. 
In fact, if you look in Job, there's many times that Job is referred to as a man of high integrity, and it's talking about his blameless life. Now, how do we gain this blameless life? Blameless, listen to this. Blameless is more of an action than it is an accomplishment. In other words, it's not like I can live my life and be like Job and fashion my life like him, and I can arrive at a point where I can live a perfectly blameless life. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of God's glory. Is that right? If we've all fallen short of God's glory, then there's going to be things in our life every day that I fall short. How many of you never mess up in a day? We all have those times. We all have those places. We cannot be perfect. In fact, sometimes people get to looking for a church. Some of you have heard this. Some of you haven't. I've heard the people saying, I'm looking for the perfect church for me to join. Now, if you happen to find a perfect church, I will tell you this. Don't join it because you're probably going to mess it all up. But the truth is this. There is no such thing as a perfect church. Amen? Now, I think First Baptist Church is as close to perfect as it gets. You know that? I love this church. I love the people in it. I love everything about it. We worship the risen Savior. And I believe this church is headed towards trying to be that blameless church, that blameless people that God wants us to be. But as we look at Job's life, we look at what really the characteristics that shaped the blameless actions of Job. Remember, uh, blameless is an action, not an accomplishment. I don't have to perfect my life, but it's an action that is the process that we go through. First of all, here's what Job did. Job offered himself to God. In fact, if you look in verse 5, it talks about this. It was in the days of the feast when he had, they had run their course. His children had had some kind of a feast. They thought maybe a birthday festival or something like that. I tell you what, we'd, we'd throw birthday parties now. But in their day, when somebody had a birthday or a celebration or an anniversary, they would run it for a week long. And so the kids would get together, and they would come together, and they would have this party. Now, a lot of people try to say that, well, they had these wild, drunken fests and all this. It really doesn't say that in the Bible. We, we kind of think that there must have been something there. But they had gotten together to have these, these feasts, these parties. And Job was such a, a, a blameless man. He wanted to make sure not only he was right with God, but his family was too. And so Job would offer up burnt offerings, it says in verse 5, to the Lord. He would do this, he would send for them, he would bring them together, and he would sanctify them in what way? He would bring an offering, a burnt offering before God. Now, in the Old Testament, that's a picture of being sanctified before God. You would bring together all of the people, and you would set up this altar, and you would sacrifice an animal or something to God. Now, the Old Testament sacrifice never did cleanse everyone and make anybody perfect before God. I can tell you that. But we see in the New Testament that there's a sanctification that is apart from the law of God. This sanctification was that people would come before God and they would know that there was wrong in their life. They would admit that. And through that, they would confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. You see, the Bible says that Jesus was sent and he died once and for all, that our sins may be forgiven. Amen to that? That Jesus came and he was the offering. In Hebrews, it talks about that he is our high priest, that he went before us, that he died on the cross, that he shed his blood, and now he sits at the right hand of God. And by that, we know the offering that was given for us was the offering to sanctify us. Well, you see, in the Old Testament, the sanctification came through offerings. Aren't you glad that every time that you mess up, you don't have to come and offer some kind of an offering to God? I believe that if that was my life and I wanted to be blameless before God, I would just have to camp out at that altar and say, God, I'm sorry for this. God, I'm sorry for that. God, I'm sorry for this. God, I, forgive me for that. God, this wrong thought, this wrong action, all these things. And then it wouldn't cover everything. You see, I believe that the sanctification that comes through Jesus Christ, it took away all of that. There was now no more need for those offerings. It was the New Testament and the New Covenant. But in that time, Job, to be right before God and to make sure his family was right. How many of you want your family right before God? We all do. Then I believe if we're going to want our families to be right before God, we need to be as blameless as we can. In, in fact, he offered offerings. And here's something else that I think Job did. He took ownership of himself and his responsibility. 
Do you know that we've raised a society of people that will not take responsibility for their actions? We've raised a society that feels like they're entitled to things. We've raised a society that will not admit it's not everybody else's fault, it's my fault. Right? How many people in this world will not take ownership? They begin to blame everything else. Do you know what a blameless like looks like? It means I'm not going to blame everybody else. I'm going to blame myself. And I'm going to take ownership. So here's what we have to do if we want to live a blameless life. I've got to stop blaming everyone, everybody else. It's the system's fault. Everybody else is causing me to fail. And to begin, or to stop making excuses and to begin living for Jesus. It's exactly what we need to do. You know, I believe that Paul understood that. The Apostle Paul, he lived a blameless life. How did he do that? He realized that what I'm doing is not right. I've got to turn to Jesus and I've got to give my life to Christ, and I no longer have to be perfect. I just have to be headed towards a blameless life and the perfection of Christ. Job was blameless in his life. Do you know what happens in most believers' lives today? Most people, they don't want to live a blameless life. They want to live a life of settling for second best. We want to settle on not what God's best is for us. We, know, we don't want to strive for what God wants for us. We just want to leave a lot, live a life of mediocrity. It's kind of like the kid that goes through school. The kid that gets C's all the way through school and you know that they could get A's. Gordon, you probably saw a lot of those kids in your day. How painful it is to see somebody who can get an A and, and, and they could actually, or get a C and they could actually get an A in life. You wonder why you struggle. You wonder why things are going on. All things are going to keep going on. But if you want to strive, you've got to strive for the A and not just to get by. A blameless life is this. It is someone who's trying to live a life of integrity before God. It says Job was blameless. The next thing it says here, he not only lived a blameless life, Job lived an upright life. I was trying to think of that word upright, and I was looking at that, and, and, and upright, here, here's the conclusion that I came to. I thought about this church building, and I thought about the building construction, and my mind always goes back to that for some reason all the time. And I thought about the painstaking process at the very beginning to make sure all these walls were straight. Now, I can tell you all the walls in this church are not exactly straight. And some of you know that, and some of you don't. That's right. Some of you who hung sheetrock, some of you who hung things on the wall and things like that, or worked with doors and stuff like that. Mike, you can testify. It's not perfect, is it? But we made it work. That's right. Well, I'm going to tell you about a wall in this church that most of you don't know about. But here's the deal. The more square and straight a wall is, the better off it is for everything going on around it. In other words, there is a door in this church that once these fine men hung the doors in the church, when the door shut, the door did not shut the same at the top as it did the bottom. Now, that doesn't seem like a great big thing when you're building a wall and it's a quarter inch off, but when you hang a door and you can see a gap at the top and it's shut at the bottom, that's a big problem. In fact, Doug Cox would say it's totally unacceptable. Doug Cox was ready to tear the whole church down and start over when he found that wall in the church. I, I'm not kidding you. We had to hold him back. We had to put handcuffs on him. He was ready to tear the wall out. But I can tell you, he's a big part of the reason why this church is the way it is because he would not accept less than the best for God as, as well as others. Well, little do you know that that wall, nobody's ever going to notice what's wrong with that wall because that wall, instead of you know, we handcuffed Doug and said, Doug, we're not going to do it this way. And, and we said, we got a way we can fix this without straightening that wall. Because this is a support wall, it would be a major project. Doug said it wouldn't take no time, it was going to take six months to fix it. I just know it would have. So Doug's nephew, Rob, comes in. Now, Rob, I'm going to kind of use you for an illustration, not, not, not in a bad way, but, but in a good way. Rob was asked to do something. Rob was asked to straighten something up. A whole lot simpler than straightening the whole wall up. Rob came in, and most of you do not know this, but he fixed a problem, covered up a problem, and you will never know the problem in, that, in this church. I thank God that Rob had a solution for that. I thank God that most of you will never know when you shut a door, and there's 70 doors in this church, 
So you'll probably never know unless you were here and, be, and involved with that which door it was. You can go around and look and you probably will never tell. Now how does that relate to our life of being upright? Well, I was thinking about it this way. There are times in our life when we think that we are right with God and right with the world. You see, I believe in a 90 degree angle when it comes to building, isn't it? Rob, when you're building something, you want it to be perfectly up and perfectly square, right? When you're building the wall. And the truth is, a lot of times in our life, we settle for less than perfect. We think that it really won't matter, but in the end, whenever you begin to fine tune and fix things down the road, you realize this is a big problem. Now here's, it's, not, it's totally unacceptable, right? What if we had this attitude that whenever my relationship with God or my relationship with the world, if something was wrong, I need to get it right immediately. Because if I don't do that, down the road somewhere, like hanging a door, down the road somewhere in my life, that is really going to cause a major problem and be a major problem to fix. Now I'll tell you this, if we knew that when that wall was being built, we'd have spent a little, well I say we, somebody would have spent a little more time making sure that wall was straight. How does that relate to an upright life? Here's the deal. There are times in our life when we think good is good enough. And we think within a quarter of an inch, that's all right. In the building, construction, you want it perfect. Why? Because you know that everything that is going on right here, it can affect everything else. Sometimes we try to take things we know are wrong, and we decide we're going to take the other route, we're going to cover it up, and nobody will ever know. You see, the bottom line is this. If we're going to live an upright life, we have to live right with God and we have to live right with this world. In other words, the things that we do in our life, it's going to affect everything else. We think that, what happens if I fudge just a little bit on my taxes? Everybody does that. It's okay, isn't it? I don't know. Is that right before God? What happens whenever you cheat on that test? What happens whenever you do things that you know God doesn't want you to do? What happens with just for one time you watch that movie that you know you shouldn't watch? Or you listen to something at work that you know you shouldn't be listening to? One little time, and all of a sudden, you're not quite exactly the way God wants you to be. Do you know what Job was? Job was an upright man. How do I know that? The Bible says so. What does the Bible say? Well, his public life was right. In verse 3, here's what it says. It talks about his possessions. It talks about all that he had. At the end, though, it says this, that this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. Now, you don't get to greatness and you don't get to rightness if you don't have integrity with people. If people don't know they can trust you, if people don't know that they can believe you, it is, wrong, it is hard to get to the point that you're right with God and with others. His public life was great. People respected him. People honored him. People knew that he was a righteous guy. He was an upright man. If he said something, you could believe it. Whatever he did, they knew it was right. His, what, but what about this? And I don't want to focus on this because here's what happens. I want to go to the next point on that. You know, it's one thing for us to be upright in public. In other words, when you come into church, everybody looks at you, and I'm thinking, you know, you guys are upright people. You know, you may not be sitting square in your seat, but I know you're upright. You're trying to live a right life in public. You're trying to do the right thing. You're coming in here, and all that I know is this. It seems like you're right with God and you're right with others. But what about in private? What about not just your Sunday attitude actions? What about Monday through Friday and Saturday? And when you leave church, what, d d is that upright? Is that right with God? You see, his public life, they thought, they looked at him, wow, that's a great guy. But what about his private life? You know, it talks about his family. Now, Job had ten kids, seven sons and three daughters. We'll talk about that probably at another time. He was blessed by God to have seven sons and three daughters. That was a big family. They looked at that as a sign of prosperity to have a big family. And he had seven sons. And sons, in, in the Bible day, sons were very, very much honored. They carried on the name. Job was blessed. So in his public life, he was, he, it said he was great. What about in his private life? You know, here's what I want you to hear from that. Remember what I said about integrity? 
Integrity is not just what people at church think about you. Integrity is what your family would think about you. Integrity is not just the way you live out in public. Integrity is what you live behind closed doors. You can be the most upright person in this church, but when you go home and when you go to your work and when you go behind closed doors, what is your life like? Would your family say that you're the same person in public as you are out of public? Would you say that your family is the most important people that you want to influence in your life? Then wouldn't you want to live the most upright life in front of your family as well as out in public? You know, I'd say this, just by reading these first five verses, I believe that Job's kids could say this about Job. Number one, I believe that his family would say that Job was a provider. Job provided for his family. He took care of them. Now, I think he may have spoiled them a little bit, but how many of you know of anybody who doesn't spoil their kids anymore? He spoiled his family. He set them up. They had property. They had land. They had money. They were able to have these feasts, I believe, directly because of Job. Job was a provider. Job was a spiritual leader. When Job saw that something was wrong in his family, he was the first one to be upright and say, you know what, my kids may have done something wrong here. Let's all come together. And, and it says he would send for his kids and sanctify them. You know what that means? He would call a family meeting. When's the last time behind closed doors you've called your family together and said this, you know what, I don't think we're going right and we need to get this right. You know, you dads out there, you fathers, you husbands out there, it is our responsibility for all of us to live an upright life. And what your wife and your kids and everybody around sees is most important in the home. You see, Job called his family together and he sent for them. He sanctified them. In other words, he said, you know what? I haven't done anything wrong, but I'm sure that, that I'm, I'm concerned about you guys and so here's what, we're going to offer an offering up to make sure you guys are right with God. When's the last time you sat down with your kids and said, you know what, we need to be sure that we're honoring God with everything we do. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that you're right with God too. They saw that in their dad. What else did their kids see? They, they saw that dad played no favorites. Now if you ask my son, he would say that we played favorites with our daughter. If you ask my daughter, she would say we played favorites with my son. You see, I believe that in a lot of families, now, now it balances out because I did play favorites with my son and my daughter. I spoiled them too much, I'm sure of that. But my kids are in church today, and I'm thankful for that. And so, are we living a life that would make our kids want to continue to come to church when they get out of church? Are we living the kind of life that our kids say, you know what, you say one thing at church, but you come home and you're, you're living a different life. You're saying different things. You're watching the wrong things. Your kids watch what you do. But you see, I believe that Job played no favorites. He sanctified all of them. Not just the boys, not just the few, but every one of them. He wanted to make sure every one of his kids were right. If you have a child that's not right with the Lord, there is hope. You continue to live that upright life and they will see that in you. Job was an upright man. Are you living upright? Not only in public, but in private. Next thing I want us to hear today, Job, the Bible says this. He was not only blameless, he was not only upright, it says that Job feared God. Do you know there's a lot of things in this world that we're afraid of? Isn't that right, Merle? There's a lot of things we're afraid of. Merle says he's scared of Becky, and I believe that. Most guys say they are afraid of their wife, right? But the truth is this, we can be scared of something, we can be scared of spiders and snakes and things like that. We went mushrooming yesterday and I saw a snake right off the bat, walked in the woods, saw a snake in front of me. I told Eric this, I said, I don't mind a snake. There's two kinds of snakes that I love the best. Ones that I see way out ahead of me and ones that are dead. As long as I see them, I'm okay. But snakes, spiders, all these things, we can be scared of things. Some people are scared of the dark. Some people are scared of the future. Some people are scared of dying. Some people are afraid of all these different things. But the fear of the Lord is not being scared. I heard something said the other day. If we feared God the way that we should, we would need to fear nothing else. If we don't fear God the way that we should, then we should fear everything else. 
It says that Job feared God. Now, fear is something that we need to understand. Here's what the fear of the Lord is. It talks about it in the Bible many times. The fear of the Lord is this, that I have a reverence for God that I have for no one else. Do you know what happens? A lot of times we think we have reverence for God and we don't. We think that showing up for church and, and doing our little things for God is a reverence of God. If you realize and you really buy into the fact that God has made you and God can take you out, God knows everything you do in public, God knows everything you do in private, He's omnipotent, all able to do all things, God sees you at your worst time and God sees you at your best time. God knows what you do when nobody else is watching. God is there. God knows how much you're giving to him, how much you're not. And God knows everything in between. God is a God to be feared. Why? Because God created us. God made us. God has a plan for us. And someday we will be accountable to him. You know, when I was growing up, in fact, I, I got my feelings hurt Wednesday night. We were in Bible study, and I made this comment. We were talking about Romans 8.28, and I said, has anybody of you ever seen something good come out of something bad? And my mom said, yes, you. <laughs> that, that broke my heart. My old mama said that about me. I know she was just kidding. She was getting me back for that ashtray last week. I know that, yes. But you know the bottom line is this. I know growing up, I wasn't perfect. I know some of you think I was. I wasn't. Some of you lived alongside me, so you know that I wasn't. But there was something that kept me from doing some of the things that all the other kids were doing. There was something inside of me, deep down inside of me, it was a fear with inside of me, and it was a fear that I thank God that I had. You know, I can't say that I always focused on God as I was growing up as a teenager. If you say that, I would have to question that, because usually your teenage years, you're not thinking about God. You know, I wanted to do my thing, I wanted to do it my way and all these things, and I thank God that I had parents that were living upright. Because when I would be tempted to do something that I knew was wrong, I didn't, I'm not perfect, I'm not saying that, but when I knew that I knew that I shouldn't do something wrong, I had a fear inside of me that went right back to my parents. Now, I knew that I'd get punished, and I knew that it was wrong, and I knew that things could happen. It wasn't a fear. I wasn't scared of my parents. But they had instilled in things in me behind closed doors that they didn't just live their life out in public upright. They lived it right behind closed doors. And my fear was that I would hurt them. My fear was that the respect and the, 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 the feeling that I had for my parents, I did not want to hurt them. Now, the reason I say that is this. If you understand how to fear God, it will keep you from doing things you know you shouldn't be doing. If you have a reverence for God that goes beyond measure, a reverence for God like, you, like I did for my parents. I didn't want to hurt them. I didn't want to, to hurt their, their name or the, the reputation or whatever you want to call it. Do you know the things you do when you don't fear God? Is you can drag God's name right through the mud. The things that you can do out in public, behind closed doors, wherever it may be, and you know there's something that God's already put on your mind right now, and you know that if God, if it was brought into the light, that God's name would be drug through the mud. Job feared God. Doesn't say he feared his heaven, or earthly father, it says he feared his heavenly father. He feared God. Do you fear of letting God down? Is there a time in your life when you've thought about, you know, the way I act, the way I live, the things I'm doing, the things I'm saying, the things I'm watching, the places I'm going, that I could really let God down? Job feared God. The last thing that Job did was Job shunned evil. Now, I believe that fearing God and shunning evil goes hand in hand. Did you know that? 
If you don't have a fear for God, you're not going to show evil. If you don't show evil, you really don't have a fear for God. What does it mean to do that? Well, you know, I heard something said yesterday at a conference that I went to. What does it mean to shun evil? I heard somebody say this. They said, you know, whenever someone's trying to get rid of something in their life, trying to live for God, trying to do the right thing, how many of you want to live for God? You want to please God. You, you want to fear God. You want to live the right way. You want to live an upright life. You want to be a, live a blameless life. And so there's these things that you draw a line and say, you know what, I know that God doesn't want me to do that. On this side of the line, this is against what God wants me to do. And on this side of the line, it's where God wants me to be. Now, we would all agree with that, and we would all say amen to that. I want to be on the right side. God doesn't come over to your side. You have to step into God's side. Did you know that? But here's what he said. He said, people find things that they know they need to get rid of or ways they need to be right with God, and they draw that line, and instead of trying to run away from the line, they want to tiptoe around that line as close as they can get. Now, I know there's things in your life that you're saying, you know what, I know that this is not what God wants for me. I know this is not where God wants me to be. I know that this is not what I want people to know of me. I want people to know I am a person of integrity, and there's something there that's keeping me from that. Instead of looking at that and looking at that line and saying, you know what, I can walk this line, and I'm right there real close, still kind of right here on the line, you need to be fleeing from that. How many of you in your right mind, if something was on fire in your life, you wouldn't run away from that as hard as you could? How many of us in our life, if we knew something that was going to hurt us, something that was going to destroy us, something that would make us lose our integrity, the true integrity that God wants us to have, not just cheating and stealing and all that, but the true integrity like Job that God wants us to have, how many of us would say, I'm going to toe the line there and not run away. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, puts it this way. It says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Fear God. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, and pride and arrogance are the evil way. And a perverse mouth I hate. Do you see how the fear of the Lord and to shun evil go hand in hand. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Is there anything in your life that you need to start hating more and start loving God even more? You know, the truth is this. Evil doesn't come knocking at your front door. Evil tries to come in the back door. The devil doesn't come dressed in a red suit and a pitchfork and horns coming out of his head. The Bible doesn't describe Satan as that. He, he's described as this. He's described as a wolf in sheep's clothing. He's described in one that prowls around like a lion and he wants to destroy your life. You know, if I have a lion in my life, I want to get away from that lion. I don't want to stand and tease and poke and tempt at him. You know, the truth is this, and I don't know where you stand with the Lord today. I know where I stand with the Lord, and I don't think I'm the man of integrity completely that God wants me to be. You know, a lot of times I hear people out in public say, you know, I even heard it say yesterday, you know, about me and that, that people, you know, you need to be around this guy, and you need to, to look at this guy and all that. And I'm thinking, you know what? There's things in my life that really aren't where I, God wants me to be at. There's things that are going on in my life behind closed doors. Now you're going to think, oh, yeah, he's got this deep, dark sin. I don't, but I, I struggle with things. There's probably things in my life that I don't want anybody to know about. Maybe in my past, maybe right now. Who knows? I'm not perfect. But God calls us to be blameless. God says, you know what? You need to be turning and heading as far away from that as you can. Are you living a life of integrity? 
does everything that people say and think of you match up with who you really are? Now, I'm not talking about those big things. I'm talking about those little things. Do you know what happens? The little things in life are the ones that usually will destroy a person. Those little things that we think, you know, it's okay, it's all right, and everybody does it, all these things are okay, we think that's all right, but in the end, those are the things that will kill our integrity. Are we living that life being blameless? Is that where you are? You know, the only way that we can truly be blameless before God is through the blood of Christ. Maybe somebody here today that needs Jesus in your life. You're trying to do a good thing. You're trying to do a right thing. You want to be a person of integrity. You will never be right with God without Christ. If you need Jesus in your life, here in a moment you're going to have an opportunity to come and say, Jesus, I want to be right with God. You've got to get right with Him before you can be right with anybody else. But what about us as believers? Are you willing to say, you know what? Maybe the integrity of my life isn't match up everywhere that I think it does. Maybe there's some things in my life that I need to let God examine, and maybe the things that I try to pretend that I am, some things I'm not. Maybe there's something you need to flee from right now. We're going to bow for a word of prayer as Todd comes. You be thinking about what God is speaking to you right now. Let's pray. Father God, we just come before you. You're a holy and almighty God. Lord, you know everything about us. You know everything within us. You know our life here in this church. You know our life behind closed doors. You know the way we are with our family. You know the way that we are around other friends. You know the way that we are when we go to work. You know the way that we are when nobody's looking. God, I pray that we would be a people of integrity, like Job. Father, I pray that we would live our lives in such a way that at the end of the day, when somebody does our funeral, they could stand and say, that was a man of great integrity. Or that was a woman who lived her life in the integrity of the Lord. And everybody who saw that, even their family and friends, would say amen. Father, forgive us where we fail you. Lord, there's nobody actually perfect in the sense of that word other than Christ. If someone needs Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior today, help them to see that Jesus can make them as white as snow. Anything that they've done, we don't get our lives right with Jesus and come to Him. We come to Christ. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And He makes us right and helps us to live a life of integrity. Father, we thank You for Jesus. It's in His name we pray. Amen.